May we have your attention, please? 2023 marks the 20th anniversary of the creation of RSSB as an independent body charged with supporting the industry to improve its safety performance. The risk that comes with operating a very busy and extensive rail network comes from many areas. As we look back at the last 20 years, there are specific incidents that mark milestones in our learning experience. This episode is the first in a short series that takes a look at some of those incidents and the risk areas that they relate to. One of the biggest contributors to railways' overall risk is level crossings. With me today to talk about one specific level crossing accident is Michael Woods. Michael, before we get into the detail of this incident, could I ask you to tell us how you came to your current position with the railway? Well, I joined British Round just about 50 years ago as a traffic management graduate trainee. My career has included work in Bristol, Newcastle, Kent, and much more recently London. I've covered both freight and passenger roles, worked in public relations and marketing, and I was fortunate to work as personal assistant to Sir Robert Reid, who was then British Rail Chairman, and I was then one of the founders of Eurostar. I later became technical director at the Office of the Rail Regulator and then worked in consultancy before joining what was then Railway Safety in its research and development team just over 20 years ago. Thank you, Michael, and welcome to the RSSB podcast. You're going to talk about the improvements in safety at level crossings, which RSSB helped Network Rail achieve in the aftermath of the accident at Ufton Automatic Half Barrier Level Crossing in 2004. Could you remind listeners of what happened? Yes. On the 6th of November 2004, just after 6 in the evening, the 1735 service from London Paddington to Plymouth, formed with an Intercity 125 high-speed train, led by a Class 43 power car, collided with a stationary Mazda car at an automatic level crossing close to the rural West Berkshire village of Ufton Nervit. A long time later, an inquest concluded that the crash was caused by a chef who worked at a hotel three miles away, committing suicide by parking his car on the crossing. All eight coaches of the train were derailed, and the rear of the high-speed train came to rest about 100 metres beyond the crossing. Seven people were sadly killed in the crash, the car's driver, the driver of the train, and five of its passengers. Official estimates put the number of people on board at between 180 and 200. About half of these were injured, 12 of them seriously. 11 people had to be cut free from the wreckage. One interesting and fortunate feature of this was the high structural integrity of the Mark III coaches, which prevented a much higher death toll, plus the fact that the more lightly loaded first-class coaches were at the leading end of the train. Thank you, Michael. That's a description of the accident itself. How did you get involved? Well, I'd been out at a concert in London and had a meal with a friend that Saturday evening. Just before going to bed, and almost on impulse, I decided to catch the late news, and so I found about this tragic accident and immediately called my director, Aidan Nelson, who, like me, had a deep interest in level crossing safety, still does actually, and between us we had a lot of knowledge about the subject. So we agreed that he would start digging into all the published data we had about level crossing safety, all the trends, all the information, previous accidents and so on, and I would concentrate on existing ideas for developing research proposals which we had on file, and of course, thinking about what needed to be done. By early Sunday morning, we already had the bones of a paper describing the risk profile and detailing six research projects that we felt would probably be relevant in the months and years to come. I spent much of the weekend fleshing out the research proposals, and by Monday morning, we had a paper ready designed initially to brief ministers. That morning, Network Rail's chief executive briefed the Secretary of State about what was then known about the causes of the accident. Of course, nobody had any information about whether it might have been a suicide event at that stage and how recovery arrangements had been progressed. On the Tuesday, 
Our chief executive, Len Porter, and Aidan met ministers, and they were very pleased to note the positive reaction by the Secretary of State to our analysis and our proposed work streams. At an all-company briefing probably a year later, Len explained that this particular meeting had so impressed government that it materially helped head off an attempt to merge RSSB into Network Rail as part of a wider process of industry change that was ongoing at that time. Our depth of analysis and how we proposed to develop it into new safety improvements had been very influential. Independence was then, as now, a very important factor. After all, that is why we'd been set up in the aftermath of the Labrook Grove accident in 1999. Thank you, Michael. That all came well after the accident, but what were the immediate activities that took place? Right. Well, there were two main parallel activities, one involving research and one involving looking at public proposals which started pouring in about improving level crossing safety. I'll start with the research. The two main areas were the development of an obstacle detection or radar crossing technology to start replacing many of the automatic half barrier crossings, such as the one at Ufton. We also managed and funded a major upgrade of the all level crossing risk model, which had been progressed from British Rail days to the mid 2000s and which is now owned by Network Rail. This helps them to prioritise investment and improvements of level crossings in the round. For me, the really most significant project was to develop the application of new technology, well, it was new in Britain, to specifically reduce the risk of a car or other vehicle being stopped at a level crossing and impeding the progress of a train. Now, Network Rail had already looked at and trialled one obstacle detection crossing near Peterborough, and the technology was widely in use in Japan and to an extent in Germany and Italy but it had been rejected here basically because, as well as detecting large objects which should not be on a crossing, the system also reacted to smaller or transient blockages such as animals on the line. This meant that trains got stopped unnecessarily, and it took a long time for us collectively to finesse this particular radar technology, which later came in use with the addition of another technology called LIDAR, which stands for Light Detection and Ranging. This is designed to detect individual members of the public who maybe had fallen down next to or across the rails. These had been very few in number over the years, but ORR, the regulator, were concerned that we should be able to reduce risk to pedestrians as well as collisions with road vehicles. As well as creating a big safety benefit, this combination of technology allowed automatic half barrier crossings to be upgraded without creating the need to have a workstation in a signalling centre for each group of three or so crossings. This in turn enabled the development of the rail operations centres, which are still the cornerstone of Network Rail's signal control strategy, and saved a huge amount of space and, of course, staffing requirements, particularly in areas where there have been traditionally labour shortages. So I think we're very proud that we help both safety and economy and efficiency to be improved. Thank you, Michael. So that covers the work going on in and around the industry. What about ideas from the general public? Well, we had over 100 proposals from ministers, MPs, peers, local authorities, academia, suppliers and the public. Over a period of six months, we worked through all of these, and by we, that was a group I led with network rail, regulators, civil servants from the Department of Transport, and and other people around the industry, and we responded to them all after considering which of them were worth taking further. The ones to be taken further included the radar technologies and, of course, proposals to increase the pace of level crossing closures, i.e. closing the crossings completely, permanently, which in many cases required construction of bridges or diverting roads or footpaths. In fact, at Ufton, there had apparently been proposals to build a bridge, but local landowners had blocked this or made the idea pretty well unaffordable. Network Rail has now got much smarter at implementing this challenging process and the number of level crossings has been markedly reduced over these 15 or so years. That in turn, of course, reduces the risk profile enormously. But the biggest technological improvement, I think, has been the obstacle detection solution. Some of the proposals from the public were almost in the mad professor category, including creating a deep pit 
filled with spikes, which a car would fall into if it passed a set of red lights on the approach to the crossing. In fact, a similar technology was then already in use in the Russian Federation, whereby, just like a car park exit lane, if you don't put your money in or you pass the red light, a ramp goes up and blocks the car. Of course, if the road vehicle is approaching such a ramp at 40 or 60 miles an hour, the damage to the car and the likely impact on its occupants would be severe. And so these two proposals were never developed further because the consequences would probably be far worse than the likely improvements and benefits. All these required a great deal of collaborative work across the industry with government, regulator and so on, and companies involved in supplying equipment to ensure that we were not rejecting good ideas. Thank you very much. In the Afton accident, there were injuries and fatalities caused both inside and outside the train carriages. As I remember, we did a lot of research into crash worthiness of trains as well. Would you tell us briefly about that? Yes, the train coaches had stood up pretty well, to, very well to the accident, but many of the injuries and some of the fatalities had been to people ejected through the windows or rammed against furniture. Our engineering team worked on a range of proposals which resulted in changes to the glazing in rail coaches and the design of seat and tables. But the addition of seat belts, an idea which keeps coming back, was very definitely not supported. And I haven't really got time today to go into why, but it's all documented on our website. We also looked at the issue of the closing speed of derailed trains approaching further obstacles like facing points, because the siding points just beyond Ufton had had a material impact on what happened on that occasion. These were all very important pieces of research, but the key one is surely to prevent the accident happening in the first place. Since 2004, there have been two major accidents in which passengers have sadly lost their lives, at Grey Rig in 2007 and more recently at Carmont in 2020. So the Ufton accident is not unique, and as an industry we have to work together to reduce the risk of such accidents. Thank you, Michael. Examples indeed of how wide-ranging the RSSB research and development program is, but back to the subject in hand, where are we with level crossings today? Well, Network Rail has closed hundreds of crossings in the years since the Upton accident and upgraded many others. They now lead further research in this area, but RSSB is still involved in recording and modelling the data and giving advice on particular issues. We've recently been working with Network Rail and the regulator to develop the legislation to modernise the signs at level crossings on private roads, all based on one of three research projects we did on signage. This work is, of course, led by the Department for Transport and hopefully will soon lead to a bill before Parliament to change those signs. Level crossing risk is steadily improving, but as they say, an industry's reputation will always rest on the most recent accident and its causes. Accidents still happen, and injuries and fatalities still happen. Every person involved is someone's father, brother, wife or sister or child, and we have to work together to try and reduce the likelihood of all such events. A very good thought on which to finish, Michael. Thank you for taking the time to talk through this important aspect of the work that RSSB has been involved in from its earliest years. We'll be reflecting on other aspects of RSSB's work over the last 20 years in future episodes. So thank you for listening. And remember that RSSB is with you every step of the way. (laughs) 